If it doesn't include the Redeemer, it's not repentance. They have to be connected to the covenant. They got to be connected to the Redeemer. They got to be connected to him. Like, so it's not a punishment. It's not a penalty. It's not a payment. People are just finding out that the well of water that the world offers just makes them more and more thirsty. Love and faith is always a better motivator than fear and punishment. The plan of redemption was given before the world was created. Christ isn't the backup plan. He is the plan. Repentance yeah. was not is not the backup plan. It, it really it really outlines how Satan works. It really gives his whole scheme, his whole strategy is like he makes people feel complacent and that they're fine, nothing's wrong, all is well in Zion, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And he guides them carefully down to hell. If the principles found in this book of scripture applied can turn us into new creatures in Christ, like that alone is such an evidence to its authenticity. I, and I've talked about this a lot. Like I struggled with pornography from the time I was 13 all throughout high school. I lied about it until I went on my mission. And so then I struggled even more when I got home. Sometimes we worship ourselves worshiping God. Mm. You know, like you understand That's, what I'm saying? Yeah. Wait, say that, that one more time. Sometimes. Bro. How we doing? This is the Paul Brothers here. And so far, 2024 has been nothing but blessings with amazing guests. Absolutely epic. Honestly, awesome. And uh, yeah, it's been a huge thing to a lot of suggestions on you guys' part. So please keep commenting of people you'd like to see on the show. This week, we have an awesome guest. His name is Stephen Jones, who has a podcast of his own called Let's Get Real. And he gives some great insights of spiritual truths that are found in the Book of Mormon that we honestly take for granted a lot of times. And we're going to hop into that as quick as possible, but we only have two weeks left until our giveaway. And you see the three gifts that we have right here that we're going to be giving away. Either the Scythian Arrowhead from 600 BC, from the place where Lehi lived, or the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, which is excellent. We also had these Christ pendant necklaces from Risen that are really awesome to wear. So these are the three things, but we have a fourth thing that we're going to be giving away to a, a fourth lucky winner of the giveaway. And this was one of the biggest blessings of 2024. One of our listeners, actually members of the Discord who has entered the giveaway and entered into our Discord, he has created... A whole Etsy shop of these incredible Book of Mormon-esque AI-generated images. I don't even know what to title these things. Yeah, they're epic, though. But they're beautiful. We have a couple of them here. There's still some more uh, that are in the docket. There's about six of them. And so one of you that joins the giveaway is going to win one of these posters that you can hang up in your scripture study den to inspire you while you go through your Come Follow Me. Now, if you're not familiar, the way you enter the giveaway is by simply joining our Patreon. You join for $1, you get one entry. You join for $3, you get three entries, plus access to our Book of Mormon Discord. And if you join for $5, you get five entries, access to the Discord, plus all of our content ad-free and in podcast form so you don't have to have YouTube open. So join the giveaway. We love you guys and enjoy the interview. If you came here like three weeks you ago, you'd be sitting in an uncomfortable barstool chair with... Man, don't even worry about it, man. I, mean, I, mean, I got my eye on you guys, man. <laughs> Dude, we appreciate it, bro. Ever since that one day we just met for yeah. like 10 minutes, yeah, we've yeah. always been talking and watching videos. Like, Stephen Jones is one of us, Bro, man. he's the dude. Well, he's it's, the it's the same, man. I'm like, these guys are in the CIA or something. Like, they, they're like, they're like, like investigating me, and I'm like, that's, I'm good with that. <laughs> dude, well, we're super pumped that you're here. We'll just start off. Uh, welcome to the Sick of Joseph. We are the Paul Brothers, and we have an awesome guest that you probably recognize if you're in the LDS YouTube space. We got Stephen Jones from Let's Get Real with Stephen Jones. Welcome to the studio, man. Uh, this is a pleasure, man. I love it. I love being here. This is good. Yeah. I For those who don't know, because I don't know a lot, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what, what's your yeah. background? Where are you from? Oh, man, my background is, is it's just really interesting. So my, I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. That's down in the south. I've lived in Utah for a while now. But, man, I, my, uh, my background is interesting. My parents, I come from, like, a multicultural, multi-racial like racial background. My mom is white. My mm -hmm. dad's black. Like, mm -hmm. I always joke around and say, like, close your eyes real quick. Yeah, yeah. That's how dark he is. That's my yeah. dad. Okay. <laughs> so, like, I grew up in this really interesting uh, spot where it's, like, I always kind of consider myself a bridge to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, in my childhood, both cultures, right, black and white, but then mm -hmm. also a member of the church in the South with a Bible belt, right? But then even in my career, I kind of start off my career in the, 
you know, as entertainment. I was mascot at BYU. Were uh, you? Did comedy. You, some refer to you as the the Mormon Old Spice guy. Is that? Oh correct? man, that was back in the day. <laughs> no, so I did comedy. I did acting. You know, that's what you're referring to. But then I went into the tech, technology world, and then um, then I started teaching seminary. And so, like, it's been interesting to be in the tech world, in religion, and just like bridging the creative with the you know with the technical. Right? Yeah. That's and a so, lot of different areas. Yeah. And then mm. it, it was just really random. I've kind of, I, I consider myself like a bridge in that way. Yeah. That's cool. You know? And it, but, but you didn't just work in the industry, like the entertainment industry. You, for the last little bit, for a while, you were teaching seminary. Right? Yeah. Almost a decade, almost a pa- the past Holy full cow. decade I've been teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Random. So yeah, I was in the tech, I was in, I, I remember the day that I was at my office, I was reading this book. Um, shout out to Greg McCune. Okay. Greg McCune, we love you. Uh, it was a book called Essentialism. And this one part of the book, it made me basically say, I'm going to do a 180. I was in, I was making good money doing sales. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, I got to quit my job. I always kind of, I wanted to teach. It was kind of a, an idea that I had to teach seminary. But um, when I first applied to do it, I was in college. I wasn't married at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I just was like, you know, Let's didn't go it. through it. It's, it's right. They, they hire like 30 people a year or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, then I ended up, I remember as I was like, I got to quit my job. I, so I quit my job and I went all in because I was already in the program at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just did acting on the side it, to like, you know, pay for. Yeah, make ends meet. Make yeah. ends meet. And then I got hired. Long story. But like I've kind of decided in my life, I only want to do stuff that will matter in a thousand years. And so uh, now I'm kind of back full circle. I'm now working with content and creation, but marrying those two worlds together with <laughs> entertainment, content creation. You're teaching. You're religion. teaching still, but you still get teaching, a, yeah. You never had a classroom filled with tens of thousands of people before, right? <laughs> but that's what you get yeah. on the internet, No, right? well, that's the cool. That's the reason why I was like, you know what? Maybe I can reach more people, but I can. St- but I do miss the classroom. I'm trying to find ways to get back into the classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's but cool. yeah. And, and with the show that you've been doing, because it's uh, like a scripture central podcast, right? That's right. So, yep, yep. And what... Uh, what what's like the main I guess goal with that podcast? So with, at Scripture Central, we're really trying to illuminate the scriptures. We want to defend the faith. We want to do things that help people clarify what they find in their study, right? Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things I mainly try to do is take real questions that people have and either interview somebody that's an expert by study or by faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's either going to be a story of someone who actually is you know, wrestling with a question, you know, some people leaving, coming back, some people like that are trying to figure it out still, or, uh, somebody who just really knows that topic really, really well. Yeah. That's, that's the bit, that's the two main buckets that we've been, that we've been playing in. Cool. That's awesome, yeah. man. Well, you've had some awesome guests on. Oh, it's been so fun. You man. had I've been Nephi, learning so much. Nephi himself. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. He was just <laughs> was at the office one day and I was like, showing up. what's up? <laughs> Nephi, go ahead. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Dude. But yeah, well, that's cool. Well, you know, today, you know, we've talked about what we can what we can talk about we're a book of mormon <laughs> channel we focus on the book of mormon and something you brought up yourself was that you think that the book of mormon explains the doctrine of christ what repentance is better than any book of scripture out there oh yeah and no so, question so we want to kind of talk about that because right now you're in a position where you're talking to a lot of people in your ward right yeah and and they have different concerns and let's talk about that a little bit. No, so so I mean, I'm, I'm in a position in my in my current congregation where it's like I, I get to talk to a lot of people, mm-hmm. and I just get to listen to them. I get to um, hear what the concerns that they are that they have um, on different levels, things that have happened to them, things that are uh, that they've done, right? And um, it's been interesting to hear because even when I would teach, and even as you know. I'll just be weird. It's just weird to say it like this. I'm a bishop, okay? Okay. okay. Yeah. Like we're like going <laughs> yeah, around true. it like you're like you the know? guy on his first day who's like, guy, like, yeah, I had know? a I had a really cool opportunity <laughs> yeah, to be pretty like, close to my mission president. president. <laughs> yeah, but, I'm, but, but the truth yeah. is, like, it is it has changed my life, yeah. man. Like it's yeah. it's it has changed. It is the most, um, it's the most intimate thing I've done. Mm-hmm. That's obviously intimacy is not just a sexual thing yeah right intimacy of just hearing people's hardest be, people that are coming with their hardest challenges mm-hmm. that they faced 
and it's over and over again, right? Listening to people, maybe six people in a day, yeah. right? Um, but one of the things that I notice is, even as a teacher and, and as, a, as a bishop, it's like people will have a problem or a question or a concern, but that's never really the thing. The thing that they say, the thing that they talk about is never really, really the thing. Like even a question that I might have, there's usually a belief underneath the question. There's usually a, yeah. a misunderstanding of some type of doctrine that would cause me to then ask that question. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah, like yeah. The, the iceberg is what you're talking about. Yeah, the you iceberg. You preach my yeah. gospel, right? Like you see the yeah. top part, yeah. but yeah. I, I can but still I, imagine but, that infographic right Well, now. You, you know that there's people who, like right now we kind of have this like, uh, people call it like an exodus. But I'm just like, you know, I, I see a lot of people coming back. I see a lot of people that are strengthening their testimonies. It's like the people that are there mm-hmm. are there. Yeah. Right? And I think before we were in a time where people were kind of in between, you know, some people. But right now, I feel like the people who are there are there. I do too. And then the ones that do have, you know, struggles and challenges, it's just the Book of Mormon really is the foundation. That mm-hmm. the answers are there, the, that they can help them. You know? For sure. And I think a part of that is... People are just finding out that the well of water that the wo- the world offers just makes them more and more thirsty. Yeah. And so then they're just like, I need to go back to the true well of water. And that's, I, I've experienced it myself in, in small ways that just the world, it, it, it's really good marketing. The, the adversary is really good at marketing. He kills it because he tricks you and you really, really believe that if you chase after fame, if you ch- chase after wealth, if you chase after the the carnal things of the world that you'll be filled and it blinds you man if i'm serious like this sounds so cliche but i'm telling you it's like have you talked to someone and you're like well it's like the like it's really this and they're like Mm -hmm. what are you talking about Mm -hmm. you're like you're not even speaking the same language obvious yeah you're not you're not the same language but i don't know man and i don't say this in a in a with any contempt at yes. all. I'm just saying that um, you make me think of Second Nephi chapter 28. Is it chapter 28, right? That the, the devil, the way his strategy is, right? It's just yeah. a little, like, it, it, really, it really outlines, you know, how Satan works. It really gives his whole scheme, his whole strategy is like, he makes people feel complacent and that they're fine, nothing's wrong, all is well in Zion, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he guides them carefully down to hell to where they get to the point, what do they say? That there is no devil. There mm-hmm. is no hell. Yeah. But see, but see, that's the thing about deception. It's not deception. If you know what's happening, it's not deception. Yeah, for sure. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, which is so scary about it. And yeah. It, like, if you're not on your toes, if you are comfortable that you're not being deceived in any sort of way, you probably got to check yourself. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm always asking myself the question, even though I'm firmly in the camp of, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the restoration, I'm always making sure that I'm not being deceived even by voices inside. Yeah. Because there's, you know, there's so many people online that they know, they know what the scriptures really say. They know what this really says. And as soon as you just wholeheartedly start jumping in and taking things at face value, that's when you start to adopt, you know, insidious beliefs that on the face of it don't seem that way. But if you're not asking the question, how am I de- being deceived? Then you're probably in trouble. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Uh, going back to you saying that you feel like there's a lot of people coming back. I, is there any statistics out there? Or I would like to know, like, what know. percentage of people that leave the church end up coming back? No, I, I just think it's funny because I've seen some of these stats, right? That of people leaving. Like, <laughs> what kind of. What if kind you of have st- taken any stats class, you got to look at the stats, okay? Yeah. yeah. The stats are like within one to two percent. But, like, if you show a graph of one, of a scale of one to five, one to seven, yeah. that that's gonna be like a like a straight drop you got me yeah right so i mean you, if you look at some of the stats that i that, that that are available right we're talking about maybe a decrease of like and don't quote me on this you can fact check this yeah. but i would say that they're not like they're like within three to five percent mm-hmm. you yeah. know which i think with millions of people that can be a lot mm-hmm. but sure. at the same time it's like it makes it as if like man we're dropping 30 40 <laughs> percent i saw that Tribune but you, article. Look, you look at that you you look at that scale and it's like wait a second that thing is up close magnified and it's within a scale of five for sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, no, I get there that. was a salt lake tribune article where it was talking about like percentages of uh citizens in utah that yeah. identify as lds right and it goes from like maybe like 
60, like 50 to like, it's like a drop of like 10%. Well, or it something. drops into the minority. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. It yeah. Goes from but they have it skewed to where like the 40% is up here and then the whatever percentage it drops to, which is only like 10% is like yeah. all the way down here. So it makes it look and way you're worse. Like, oh my gosh. It's like a fourth of the population. <laughs> yeah. No. But, they but don't what's, tell you what's crazy good. is, man, this is very common. And if you open up that book and you can see like Nihor, like the, 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 um, the order of Nihor, yeah. Alma one. Like the really issues that you could see people face in the Book of Mormon itself, like we're we're facing the same kind of stuff for sure, right? And it's not. And the thing that I I dislike is when people say it's a LDS, it's unique problem to the LDS Church. The LDS Church oh, yeah. actually has oh, more yeah. retention than the rest of Christianity. Mm. We're experiencing an intensifying secularism happening in the world, especially in the United States of America, where people are ditching God altogether. So this isn't a problem that's just unique to the church. And when you look within the church, we a there's actually more retention and there's more faith because, you know, we actually require things of each other as disciples of Christ in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You know, you get called yeah. as a bishop. Yeah. That's that's hard. And that, yeah. that, that sort of service, I think it reminds us what this is all about. And so I, I do think that Latter-day Saints do hold on tighter, you know, to the word of God because of that, because of that. You service. got, you got to right now, like for, uh, what is it? Chapter eight, uh, first Nephi, like the, the whole iron rod mm -hmm. analogy or vision. Like it's so simple and it's so profound. Like it's like the different levels of people, the different levels of conversion, the different levels of, of, uh, of closeness to God. It's like, here you have this story, like the really the idea of clinging to the rod, right? Like you got to really cling to it. You can't just like casually make it back to God's presence. The people who made it back and didn't like fall away, the ones that were humble, man, they fell before him. Mm -hmm. It takes a consecration. It takes humility. This is not, you're not going to just like, like, like you're, if you're going to make it back to God's presence, it's very intentional. It's mm -hmm. not going to be by an accident. You're not going to be surprised. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In our phone call before you came in, you talked about how one thing you see as a bishop a lot is kind of a black and white mindset mm. that really like pushes people out. They're kind of like, I, I either have to be that you the way you framed it is a lot of people don't understand what repentance truly is. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about that and maybe how the scriptures teach what real repentance is. Yeah, I think I would love to do that. I think that um, it's interesting, right? So when you the song from primary and by the way, like this is not any like looking down on anyone at yeah. all I, mm -hmm. i'm just saying let me give you an example of what i mean when i say that so let's say somebody is is going to come and they want to get something off their chest or confess there's a couple of myths and i got these myths from the divine gift of forgiveness this is from elder anderson okay yeah and um people believe like, a lot of the myths that i see out there is number one they think that like that um that, pen, that that repentance is a punishment, right? Yes. It's a penalty or it's a payment, right? Mm -hmm. That repentance is an event. Like it's an it's an institutional event where I go to a bishop, the bishop almost to a degree is going to be the one who forgives you. And I'm yeah. sorry, like your bishop does not have that that ability to do. Mm -hmm. And an example of that, of what I'm getting at is um, so I'll, I'll many times, and by all means, if anybody's hearing this that has ever talked to me, this is a very general thing, okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll ask people, have you talked to God about it? Like this, this thing that you are trying to, that you want to come clean from, like, have you talked to him? And I'm going to say most times they say no. They haven't talked to him because you're, because they, they because, erroneously think you're the guy that yeah. needs to be talked to first. Well, so in this, in this, you check out, I think it's chapter eight. I think okay. it's chapter eight of, um, the divine gift of forgiveness. Um, I like the approach Elder Anderson takes. He doesn't call them myths, but he's like the pitfalls of forgiveness, I think. And it's like basically the idea is like if it doesn't include the Redeemer, it's not repentance. They have to be connected to the covenant. They got to be connected to the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. They got to be connected to him. Yeah. Like, so it's not a punishment. It's not a penalty. It's not a payment. I had these five questions I would ask my students. And I'm telling you, I would say true or false. And then I would ask true or false. Is repentance a penalty, punishment, penalty, payment for sin? And... The one that was the hardest is, can say? you earn forgiveness? Repentance is earning forgiveness. Yes. And it's, it's, you can't earn it. No. It's you freely see? given or freely withheld. Yeah. And I, you know, as someone who, I, I, and I've talked about this a lot, like I struggled with pornography from the time I was 13 all throughout high school. I lied about it until I went on my mission. Um, and then when I got home from my mission, I erroneously thought, oh, because I've spent two years 
you know, without struggling with pornography. Now it's all fixed yeah. when it wasn't. And so then I struggled mm. even more when I got home because I had this black and white mindset. And tell me what black and white when you when you say black and white mindset, mm -hmm. whenever whatever I said that I yes. said, what is it that you would understand? Yeah, the way I understand it is I'm either all good or all bad. Oh yeah. And so yeah. then and the idea of like repentance being a a payment or an act or a, an event that's the black and white thing. So mm. the idea, and this is something that erroneously a lot of high school kids believe. Oh, I'll dabble in this or I'll dabble in that. And then I'll repent before my mission. As if it's like they can do all of these things and then there's the event of repentance. Oh, I can't take the sacrament. I can't do this. Okay, well, you know, having fun right now is worth not taking the sacrament for four months. Or yeah. they look at it in this black and white way where it's like you're either all good or all bad or um, see, but it's that, that's not it's a fundamental misunderstanding of repentance. But it's taking him out of it. You see, like it, like another. This is the one that people would get wrong. Repentance yeah. is changing behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's behavior change. Mm -hmm. I stopped. As simple as that, mm -hmm. right? But I mean, there's some people that are struggling with whatever it is they're struggling with, and the thing they need, the thing they need, is the sacrament because it will help them because they are in a mindset where they don't, uh, they don't understand. They maybe not understand as clearly uh, Jesus Christ is the owner of this covenant who's mm -hmm. making a covenant with you. And whenever they do take the sacrament uh, in a different way now, that will actually allow them to look more to towards actually him. change. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? For sure. Because he, he is perfect. Yes. We're not. And we won't be. Right. But if I'm with him. Right. Then I'm perfect. That's what Brad Wilcox was teaching me the other day. Right. Yeah. Like. We keep on trying to be perfect. We keep on trying to like, okay, if I go, you know, okay, I'm going to go. If I, like, I'm just telling myself, I'll tell him, I'll go talk to my bishop. I'll wait. Let me get clean. I won't do it for this amount of time. Then I'll tell him because then I can be like, okay. Yeah. That was the know? old me. This isn't me now. You're looking yeah, at a new yeah. version. Like, I gotta, I'm going to prove it to him that I got it under control. Then I'll go take care of it. Yeah. When we should be running to him through your bishop, running to Christ, I'm saying, mm -hmm. through your bishop. Mm -hmm. Um. I know some people are going to say like Russian, uh, Russian roulette, sorry, Bishop roulette or whatever, but I'm saying Jesus Christ is the one who redeems us from our sins. It's not a bishop. It's not a prophet. The, the temple doesn't save you. The sacrament bread doesn't save you. The, uh, the water that you take at the sacrament doesn't save you. Jesus Christ saves you. Mm -hmm, Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? So Stephen, my question would be like, how would you explain to a person the functionality of going to a bishop to confess in the repentance process because I because I, I personally have had this misunderstanding as well mm. that like that is essentially a check mark that I have to do before kind of I settle things with God right but, but like it, but, we got, but hold up when uh, you tell me what, what about for you I'm not mm -hmm. your bishop man I yeah. don't want to be your yeah, bishop yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah. like I'm saying I'm saying it doesn't always be in a certain order it could be one or the other but I'm saying mm. I think a bishop can be another second witness of forgiveness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, like, meaning, like, he can get, like, what I'm saying is this, where, at what point would you talk to God in that process? Well, you, you'd be surprised how many people are afraid, and I'm saying, and I understand this, because I've been this way in my life, that you don't, I remember, man, I remember doing stuff as a kid, and you don't feel like God wants to talk to you. You don't feel like, you don't feel like you sit down. I'm just being real with you, man. Like yeah. you go down at night and you're like, I'm not going to pray. I'm going to stop praying because God, I don't think that he wants he to, talk to, want to talk to he me. He doesn't want to hear me. I'm ashamed to even say it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Revelation 12, nine is where I'm getting at. The accuser was cast down mm -hmm. who, who accused them before God day and night. Mm -hmm. And whenever you feel this accusation, which is which I feel like is the fear that causes people not to want it. They, you care about what your bishop thinks. What's your? I'm telling you, your bishop is not looking at you like, look at them. He's got his. He's got problems. He's got things that he's struggling with. He's got stuff that he's struggling with too. He needs to go to Jesus just like you do. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, it's first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Second repentance, and I think that we get that twisted. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first <laughs> repentance. <laughs> That's how we act. Yeah, right. Yeah. Repentance is the thing that I handle first. But you it, you you don't repent until 
you understand who God is mm. and who his son really is. Mm -hmm. And the Book of Mormon is that over and over and over again. Exactly. Right? Um, yeah, I think does that... Does that answer the question? I know we kind of went yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that was, that was really black good. black and white. And, and going through, like, what faith really is, I think a lot of times we think faith is just like, oh, I believe that Jesus is real. But it's like faith can be replaced with the word trust. Actually, whenever yeah. I read scriptures and it talks about faith, I always replace it with the word trust. But trust what? Yet you trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Who does he say that your he is? Your savior, right? Who did and so that he says that he is your savior, that he has that he will give you grace freely so that you may change and become a being like he is. And to me, like yes, you have to have that trust and faith or repentance is merely the side effect of faith. That's all it is. Yeah. Because as soon yes. as you trust Jesus and he says, I need you, I, there, he, these are the things that I need you to do. And if you trust him enough, you're going to change the things in your life to do those things. Ooh. And so repentance yeah. isn't a step that is separated mm. from faith. It is the side effect of true faith. Ooh, it makes me think of this analogy. I had this, uh, I had this leader one time randomly, man. We were in this room and at the end of this meeting we had, he's just like, hey, how do you knock down a tree? What, if you want to knock a tree down, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I was like, um, what are we doing, man? What do you know? And he's like, uh, I was like, you get an ax. And he's like, yeah, but where do you hit it? Where do you hit the tree? And he's like, you hit it at the base. And he said, okay, tell me this, okay. Um, a lot of times, he's, he, then he started telling me this story. He said, this girl comes into my office. He was a state president. This guy telling me this. And he's like, his uh, parents kind of scoot her into the office, right? And um, they kind of look at him, and he's just sitting at his desk. And they like scooter in the office, like, will you talk to my daughter? And like, she's been having sex with her boyfriend, basically. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. do help us do something, yes. right? Fix it. And he said, now tell me, do you believe that that young woman, she, do you believe she knew that the, that she shouldn't break the law of chastity? Mm -hmm. She knew. Yeah. He said, look, a tree, like behavior, like elder, uh, president Ballard, president, um, uh, is that, uh, no, uh, um, Bednar. Uh, no, no, no. Elder, um, elder Packer. At the time. Okay. Yeah. Doctrine understood will change behavior more than the study of behavior mm, will change yes. behavior, right? Yes. He's like, the base of the tree is like the understanding or belief. And he said the branches are the behavior. The actions. Mm. And he's like, a lot of times what we do is we just chop at the branches. You know you're not supposed to do this. You're like, but what do people believe or understand that would cause them to behave that way? Mm -hmm. And he said, I talked to her about I understood as I talked to her more that her dad was pretty verbally abusive. Yeah. And she said, and he realized that when she would sleep with her boyfriend, mm -hmm. she was hoping to make some kind of connection. That's what she wanted. Yeah. What she wanted was a connection. Uh -huh. What she wanted was to feel closer to God, mm -hmm. uh, to feel close, to feel love. She wanted yeah, love, but she love. thought that she would get love that way. She mm -hmm. believed that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's like a... It's like cotton candy, right? Mm -hmm. You just end up being more empty. Well, that's why it's a counterfeit. Yeah. A bad counterfeit or a good counterfeit looks like like it would be like it would be that way. So like trying to get love, right? Like when it's just I I totally like I resonate with this a ton because one of the big reasons why I struggle with pornography so heavily for so many years is because I believed that I was unlovable. I believed that I was like the ugly one of my friends and I would never find someone who would actually be attracted to me and and want to be with me and so i settled for what was immediately available and was that counterfeit you know what i yeah. mean yeah and i mm. i i think that that is that is a good way of looking at sin what are some if if i was coming to you and i was like i don't understand repentance what were what would be some of the scriptures you would pull up in the book of oh Mormon yeah to talk so about i would, I would say Let's the first it. The first one would be, um, it's all of the foundational verses that understand God's or Jesus Christ's merit, okay. like his ability. So I'd say Second Nephi chapter two, let's I think it's like it three and four, Okay, three and four, basically like three through three through eight okay, let's is what I would say. Second Nephi chapter two. Second Nephi chapter two. So this is uh, Lehi talking to Jacob. Um, this is, this is, this is literally, this is it's my favorite the chapter. most searched, so money. most searched chapter in the Book of Mormon. Oh, is it really? Somebody told me that the other day. It's so like good. on Google or something? Or no, like just in the um, the gospel library. In the gospel, in the gospel library, library app. Yeah. I don't know who, who who told me that. Somebody that had data on like things that people like they have data on that, that stuff. Anyway, Second Nephi chapter two. This huh. is number one. Uh, you said verses three through four in Second Nephi chapter two. Three through eight, basically. Three through eight. You can skip over five, but I feel like the the doctrine of okay. the doctrine of three through four, six through eight. 
it highlights this really, really well. Like I like to call, like I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a guy named uh, David Durfee. He's a, um, he doesn't know this, but I consider him like this a mentor of mine. Like from afar, I took this class and um, I learned these verses. I like to call them verses for when you don't feel like you're enough. Yeah. And this is the first one, Second Nephi 2, 3 through 8, basically. Okay. All right, let's 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 just go through. I'll read a couple verses. Let's do a little round robin here, dude. Read okay. the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Wherefore thy soul shall be blessed. And this is Lehi talking to his sons. And thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi. And thy days shall be spent in the service of thy God. Wherefore, I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer. For thou hast beheld that in the fullness of time he hath cometh to bring salvation unto men. And thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Wherefore, thou art blessed even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. For the spirit is the same today, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is can, free. Can I just highlight one thing? Look at verse yeah. three. It says it doesn't say it doesn't say present tense. It says past tense. Mm -hmm. That's past tense. Yeah, saying thou art redeemed. Yeah, like. Like you're already, like you're redeemed. I think the biggest misconception, people are born, in, like we're born in the fall, mm -hmm. but we're not, we're not like uh, the second article of faith, right? Mm -hmm. We're Adam's transgression in the garden and, and Moses, was it Moses five or is it Moses six? Um, he forgives them in the garden. Yeah. And we're not, we don't, we're not held responsible for the transgression. I mean, the fall, like we're going to be. As there's as, consequences. There's the consequence of the not, fall, yes. but it's a physical fallen world. My body's not perfect. Yeah. But spiritually, we're born redeemed. Mm -hmm. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and the thing I love from there is he says, because of the righteousness of thy redeemer. Yep. Right and there. He's, it's but not then your he's gonna, righteousness. So, but what I'm saying is you can't, right now he's about to tell us, you can't pay for it. Yeah. You, if you tried to pay for bills a sin, already paid, yeah, the bills already paid. It's like going to the, it's like going to the movie theater and your, and your company buys all the tickets and you're like, no, for real. Yeah. Let me, let me pay. Right. Uh -huh. Keep going. Sorry. Okay. No, it's all good. And then in six, wherefore redemption. Cause you want to skip five, right? Well, five just gives the idea. Like everybody knows the difference. Like we kind of yes. have it in us. Uh, like, you know, the light of Christ in us, we know the difference between good, good and evil, and we're going to make mistakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But. Six. Wherefore, redemption, come, redemption cometh in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin, to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Yeah, right there. You can't you can't pay the bill. He already paid it. But we act like it. I'm telling you, people. How many times would you think somebody would say, oh, "Well, I I, I I can't forgive myself," mm -hmm. and I understand that because I've felt that before. You yeah. got me? Yeah. And like I can't forgive myself. But what if he told you you're forgiven? The Redeemer who paid for everything, the one who literally like bought it with his with his whole soul, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Nah," but I can't forgive myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of think about it as like. If someone pays your bill, like if you order food, someone pays your bill, you can't like double you, the the bill. The bill's paid, right? And so, do you know how you pay them back by eating the meal? Well, that's what restitution is, man. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, like think about Alma. Restitution is, man. If he forgave me like this, well, then I need to forgive other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he forgave me like this, then I need to let people know. That's restitution to me. Like restitution is, we can always put it like monetary. Like I got to pay somebody back. Mm -hmm. You can't pay him back, but it's like the unprofitable servant, Mosiah. Is it Mosiah? Which one is it? Yeah, Mosiah two. Yes. Uh -huh. You can't. You can't pay him back. You can't pay it. It would. You would. You wouldn't. You wouldn't survive it mm -hmm. to pay for one sin. Yeah. You couldn't. But for some reason, we think that we can. I don't know why. Why do you think that is? Why is it that we makes us think that we're gonna pay it? Because we have the accuser who's in our ear constantly, you owe a debt, you owe a debt, you owe a debt. Even though it's already been paid by the Savior, he's going to let you know, and he's going to trick you into thinking that you have a debt to him when you don't, because it's already been paid. Does that Sa make sense? Satan, Satan knows who Jesus is, mm -hmm. but I don't think that he ever believed in him. Mm -hmm. And he's still saying the same lies, like he can't help you. Mm -hmm. You can't like so. Then he gets you focused on the temporary. He gets you focused on the the short short term. You can help yourself. You can just strong arm that thing. There ain't nothing you can do to strong arm it. And that's the submission. That's what I feel like it means when you fall at the tree. 
every knee shall bow. It's the humility. It's the humility that it takes to recognize and believe that Jesus really is who he says that he is mm -hmm. in these verses, that he really is the redeemer, that he really can, that he already did mm -hmm. redeem it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But but that's so simple, but it's it's hard to believe it because in the short term, it's like, well, what are they going to think about it? Oh, well, now this is this way. Mm -hmm. It's like, it take, sometimes it's going to, there's consequences of things that we've done. And sometimes the, the redemption is we won't see the full effect of it, yeah. you know, um, until the until a long time from now. For yeah. sure. But that's what hope is, mm -hmm. like, because to me it's like here's the promise in the covenant, right? The plan of redemption was given before the world was created. Mm. The plan of redemption was given before there was trees, before there was anything on the earth, before there was any fruit to eat. They we already knew that there was going to be redemption. And so then the world was made and then the covenant was made. It wasn't after. Mm -hmm. I feel like we think the commandments are like beforehand. Yeah. Right. Beforehand. Don't do this and don't do this and don't do that. Oh, by the way, there's this plan of redemption. It's like, no, the plan of redemption came first. And then it's like in order for you to get these promises of the redemption, this com these commandments are necessary. So then now we have this assurance that if I keep that covenant of who Jesus says that he is and that redemption, and here's the realization of it eventually, that's what ho hope is, all that in-between stuff. Mm. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one huge glaring thing, so I, uh, during the summer, I, I have the opportunity, I work for this organization called Humanitarian Experience. Yeah. And it's basically like FSY abroad. Yeah. And uh, I, take, I take teenagers out, and the first night, what I love to do, because every evening we do devotionals with them, I say, hey, we're going to give you these pieces of paper, write down an anonymous question um, in regards to the gospel or God, anything spiritual that you would like, you know, answered. And I was super alarmed when I saw multiple questions phrased like, how, how do I ever get the church to see me as enough? Mm. Or how, how, like stuff talking about relationship with me and the church. And I think the misconception is, is that the church, everything in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is just an auxiliary between our personal relationship with us and God and Jesus Christ. That's it. Yeah. The church isn't going to save anyone. Jesus Christ is, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that tool that we can use can help us. to approximate us to Jesus Christ. And so I think it, it all comes from having a proper understanding and gaining that relationship with Jesus Christ. Because... If a lot of people are looking towards you as a bishop as, you know, the guy that's going to be like, yeah, you're forgiven or mm, no, then like they're they're going to be focusing on all these different things that don't really have that much weight at the end of the day, if it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, somebody comes in talking to a bishop, talking. I'm, I'm looking at that heart, man. That's what I'm looking for. Like, oh, man, they're worried about their friends. This is not a covenant with your friend. This is a covenant with Jesus Christ, with Heavenly Father. I mean, to agree, like the Ten Commandments, like um, love your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that the covenants are, they are societal, right? Um, but this is like, he, the reason why you talk to your bishop is because he is responsible for the, the temporal, um, the outward, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Outward ordinances, mm -hmm. right? Um, just, that's why you, that's yeah, one of the main reasons, but to go back to what, something that you mentioned before about, um, uh, about when you should go, it's mm -hmm. in the manual. Like even with pornography, it's like, I'm not, the thing is there's, there's not, we, we act like there's these lines that are drawn mm -hmm. of like, if I do this, I got to talk to them about this. If I do this, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the stuff that you can't, if you don't feel like you can do it on your own, you need to talk to your Bishop. Yeah. Right. That, that's, that's what I think the principle is. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are against the law. Right. That, that that's and it's the more things that affect other people. Mm -hmm. And it's and then that's whenever I think you need more of the help of, of an ecclesiastical leader. Mm -hmm. But like if you feel he, he's not going to be upset if you come and talk to him. Mm -hmm. Right. No. You should talk to your parents, too. Like if you have a good relationship with them. Um, but th this idea of hiding it mm -hmm. and like it's because of what the, the behavior is because of what we understand. We think that he's going to be like, how dare you? What are, and, and, you know. 
some people's perspectives might be that some leaders have done that to them, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? But I think a lot of it is rooted in what our belief is mm-hmm. and how we see. I feel like our heart and our eyes are very connected. For sure. Mm-hmm. I think going off of when you should talk to your bishop, it's it's very much like... I. I think that confession, we separate. So like you said, we feel like there's like these steps, these exact steps, right, that need to be followed. Where it's like, I feel like confession is just a piece of recognition. It's you saying the thing out loud that you are ashamed of. And what that does, when you, like with me, for example, with like pornography, when I was able to say out loud, I can't stop looking at pornography. When I said that out loud, it was me recognizing where I truly was, but also it was me showing faith that I believed that there was something better. And I always look at confession as actually mm. bearing your testimony. You're going Ooh. in there to bear your testimony to your bishop, saying, I am this way, but I believe that there is a better way, and I know that through Jesus Christ I can do that. I need some help. Can you help me? That's what it is. Your bishop isn't, like you said, he's not the guy who says, you are forgiven, you know, and then all of a sudden you're forgiven. He's this guy who's been called to a really hard calling that sucks a lot of the time to serve and to help other people come unto Christ, not to stand in as Christ and say, I'm the one who, yeah. who saves you. Come on. Mm. Listen, look, I look. there's no such thing as a perfect bishop. There isn't. Mm-hmm. And if you think your bishop is not repent, everybody needs to repent every day. That's what Elder President Nelson said. Yeah. We need to turn to Christ every day. We like repentance is it's not I think we almost put it in that light of coming to the bishop. Mm-hmm. Repentance is is changing the it's change, it's metanoeo, right, of the Greek. It's like changing the way you see, changing the way you breathe. It's changing, an attitude. It's an not attitude. An event. And it's like and, and uh, I love what Elder Anderson says in his book, is like repenting not from the sin, but from sinning. Mm, you got that's, me? No, that is, I love that because it's not our past sins that keep us from being in God's present. It's our future sins and that it, keep us. And it's not, it's not a punishment. Mm-hmm. It's literally you turning to Jesus Christ. And a way to turn to Jesus Christ is through someone who he has called to help you turn to him. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's Guys, delicious. can I share a verse real quick? Please. Share All right. So in Moroni chapter six, um, basically this is explaining how things went down in the primitive church. Yeah. Okay, right? four. Talking about four, right? Yeah. Yeah. You already knew, bro. Knows, oh my knows, gosh. Dog. So this is the context here is talking about like the people that, you know, repent and are baptized. You know, what's next? Mm-hmm. It says <laughs> in verse four of chapter six, Moroni. And after they had been received unto baptism and were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were numbered among the people of the church of Christ. And their names were taken that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and finisher of their faith. Boom. That's Tell why. me why you like that. Why do you like that? I love that because it just shows that it's all about Christ. It's n- Yeah, other people can help you come closer to them, but we're not reliant upon those people anymore, but we're reliant solely upon the merits of Christ, who is the author and finisher of my faith. He proved it already, mm-hmm. but it's up to us if we're going to believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And it's from the beginning because I pulled up a scripture in Messiah 7 where he says, and say... Um, Okay, he says, I say that it is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, which ever were since the fall of Adam, or who are, or who ever shall be, even unto the end of the world. So what that shows, and there's an amazing book, if you guys haven't read this, by Adam S. Miller called Original Grace. Oh, yeah. And it's just this idea. Christ isn't the backup plan. He is the plan. Repentance was not, is not the backup plan. It's not like plan B. Oh, you weren't perfect. Just like I said, be therefore perfect. Oh, yeah. let's use this plan B. Yeah. No, and that's, what, that's one of my qualms with the rest of Christianity is they act, they act like Christ was the backup plan. On one end, they're like, uh, it's mm. just Christ. All you have to do is say that you believe in him. Mm. But on the, the other end, they act like the whole thing is a backup plan because the original plan was that Adam and Eve and we all live in the Garden of Eden and that somehow they tricked them and they that's not part of the plan. It was this evil thing 
that they did, and now Christ is trying to fix it because he's like, oh, my plan he's, A didn't work. He's trying to introduce the ability for you to choose it. Yes. Yeah. So you, nobody is going to be anywhere that they don't want to be. Mm -hmm. But why do you think, because I'm just trying to get at this idea, because I think this is so important, like why is it that it's so hard for us to, like if all it is is just to trust him and to come to him, why is it so hard? Mm -hmm. Like why is it so challenging to not just know about it, but to actually believe that he is the one that can take away mm -hmm took away our stain he I, is the one you know what i'm saying yeah that we actually would be willing to go to him and like act like it actually exists mm -hmm. i'm just curious what you think mm -hmm. i think it's shame like if i were to put it into one word it's shame why did adam hide himself when he heard the voice of god because he was ashamed and shame keeps us away from christ there uh, i used to have, we my wife and i used to have this podcast called i stand at the door and we picked that, and it was on how to overcome pornography. Mm. And we picked that name because mm. there's that famous um, painting of Christ, right? He's knocking on the door, and there's no handle on the outside saying you have to let him in. And what I found is that the reason we let Christ in isn't because necessarily that we don't think he is who he says he is. It's because we don't want to let such an important person into such a messy house. Mm. And we think that our that that we have to clean up our house first before we can let such an important guest in. Mm -hmm. And so what we end up doing, there's a couple things that we could do. One, we just give up. We're just like, we're never gonna let Christ in. I'm just gonna live in my mess. Two, we can just try and try and try and try and try to clean it up and live this perfectionist life where eventually we give up once again. The third one is we humble ourselves and recognize that Christ showed up to help us clean our house. He already cleaned it up. Yeah. He already, he, he already, like, it's, it's clean. I guess, I guess like, more than you anything, understand. it's accepting it. Yeah, and for believing sure. Believing it. Yes. And it's not easy. But I'm saying, like, what is it that causes us, what belief do we have that causes us to think that he, that it has to be clean before we can let him in? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What, what's, what's your best guess on that? I, I think that we just... I think that that is what the trust is. I think mm -hmm. the trust is that the reason why we do or don't do it is because, uh, well, why did Adam, because you, you mentioned Adam, because mm -hmm. to me, shame and guilt are different, right? Yeah, for sure. Guilt is good, shame bad. But see, but we act like shame is guilt and we act like guilt is shame. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard somebody explain it this way. Shame is a focus on, is a focus on us, is ourself. I'm bad. I'm bad, but even like, I'm going to think like, it's like, I think shame, a part of shame is when you think that you're going to strong arm it and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Like you're it's focused pride. on yourself, mm -hmm. but guilt is focusing on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, it's painful, but I think that we, I think maybe sometimes we confuse the two is what I'm getting at. I We're agree. thinking that it's guilt, but it's really shame. We're thinking that it's shame and it's really guilt. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know? I think, yeah, that's a really good point. I, I've always conceptualized shame and guilt as shame is I am someone bad. Yes. Guilt is I did something bad. But then I would say guilt on top of that to make it even more clear is like guilt is I did something bad. Therefore, I'm going to give that to him. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on Christ. I'm mm -hmm. going to allow him to take it. Mm -hmm. Like My identity is not the thing I did. That's why I can give it to Christ. And maybe that is what it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we're thinking is we don't want him to see our room because we think that we're our room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? Yeah. We think that he doesn't want to be with us because we are the thing. Like we're so gross. Like honestly, yeah. especially just coming from the pornography side, you feel so ashamed and so gross when that is a habit that's in your life. And I get it. I know there are people, probably thousands of people that are watching that have or are struggling with pornography and it makes you feel so gross. No one feels like a stud or pumped up after they look at porn. They're like, oh my gosh, I hope no one ever finds out. Yeah. Right. And that includes Christ. We, th we trick ourselves into thinking that he doesn't already know. Yeah. And so we, we try to hide it even from him. We build an uh, apron out of fig leaves when he wants to pre present us with robes of righteousness that he made. And the atonement of Jesus Christ, uh, the word atonement means to cover. The, the root is kafar. And so when you talk about the garden, the, the building of fig leaves is us doing our little part to try to fix our problems, right? It's us going at it alone. Like you said. How exactly. long does the fig leaf last? Right. It, it doesn't last. They, they dry up. They'll they dry up and they'll fall off and you're naked again. But then right? what does he give them? But he gives him 
robes that he made that cover his nakedness. What are they made out of? They're made Animal of skins. They're made of animal lamb. skins. Real lamb skin. Does it La- say? Does it oh, actually say lamb? lamb? Lamb skin. Does it say in the scriptures? I don't know where it's just, at. I can't tell you where it's at. <laughs> it's probably. It's I'm probably telling you, it's, it's lamb. Let's look it up. <laughs> it's lamb skin. That's actually wild if it actually is. Now listen, I don't know where it's at. I, I, you, know. <laughs> you might have just made this up. I like it though. But what I'm saying is, sense. what is what is leather? Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, it's the skin of it's an animal. Durable. Right? It's durable. Yeah. It's lasting. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's real. It's real, man. He covers you like whole. Oh, it's not. I just man. thought of another coat, connection. Coats of skin. How do you get a coat of skin? You have to. There has to be a sacrifice of life. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm Boom! Oh. I love no, that. But listen, it's lambskin. Even if it's not, it's <laughs> Moses lambskin. chapter five. <laughs> Moses chapter five. The angel appears. Why are you commit? Why are you performing the sacrifice? I yes. Don't know. And he says, "I don't know." The Lord commanded me, right? And then he says, "This you shall do in the name of the Son, forevermore." Everything that you should do, you do in the name of the Son. But I'm saying, in those moments, like I believe with Adam and Eve, that was the constant thing. I gotta find where it is. Maybe it was like a quote from a general, th- mm-hmm. from a from a prophet. Yeah, but um, that's cool. But I I believe it's lambskin. I believe that there was a sacrifice made, and that's what to them they they offered sacrifice, and that's what they that's they, what they covered. We, cool. had, we we could figure that out. Finally. Yeah, let's it. do it. Really? And and the thing that's awesome, and a lot of people point out, and we get made fun of a lot as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints for wearing our quote unquote magic underwear. Yeah, and but the the purpose of the garments is to remind us of Christ, of that sacrifice that covers us. And and we wear those every single day. And I I, I, I wish I were better at, like when I put on my garments every morning, yeah. I, I, I should be like, I should be thinking about that. That's a, that's a new goal. I'm starting it right now. When I put on my garments in the morning, I, I'm just going to say, this is a representation of Christ's sacrifice for me. I'm going to start saying that in my head because I, I want to remember that because that's beautiful. But I think one thing to point out is that like repentance it doesn't have to be just a sad thing. There's hard things about it, but it's joyous. Have you had an experience in your life where you felt the joy of repentance? Explain oh, man. that, Come dude. Come on, man. Every What's time. What's that like? Every time. Like, I think the joy comes from remembering the truth. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think it's like almost like that, that darkness that's a lie that kind of gets cast over your eyes of like worrying what everybody thinks, right? Uh, it's the joy, like... If you look in the scriptures, we just uh, there was I think it was Elder Christofferson. I have to find where he mentioned this. It's uh, it's one of the trainings that he recently did in the in the area in Utah, and he said the word joy is mostly tied to repentance in the mm-hmm. scriptures. The most times when you see the word joy in the scriptures, it's tied to repentance. Dude, that reminds me of my favorite script. This is one of the most life changing scriptures uh, in my whole life. It's the most life changing scripture probably in my life. And it was when I was in the MTC, and I, I, I shared a little bit about this. I lied about struggling with pornography because I was so ashamed. I don't want to tell my bishop. I don't want to tell anyone about it. And so I just hid, right? And when I was asked those questions leading up to my mission, if I struggle with those things, I just lied. Even though if I told my bishop, he would have been like, oh, let's help you out, man, because a lot of people are struggling with this. And there was a time where I was sitting in the MTC. I was reading the scriptures. And I read one scripture, and right then I said, hey, companion, we got to go. I went down to the missionary, the MTC office. I was like, hey, I need to talk to my branch president. I called the branch president of the MTC. I need you to meet with me right now. And I sit down, and I finally, for the first time ever, I divulged Ooh. that I struggled with pornography. Go back. And so where so did it start? It's, that's yes. so cool that like you learned something that you believed, man. And it had to do, and it had to do with that that scripture. So it's Alma, Alma thirteen twenty seven. And now, my brethren, I wish from the inmost part of my heart, yea, with great anxiety, even unto pain, that ye would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins, and not procrastinate the day of your repentance, but that ye would humble yourselves before the Lord. And call on his holy name, and watch and pray continually that ye may be tempted, ye may not be tempted above that which ye can bear, and thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love, and long all long suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that ye may be lifted up at the last day. Now it doesn't say joy in there specifically, but like if you're feeling all of these things. The love of God, that hope, 
That's that to me. That's joy, and that is what I feel when I repent. And I, I, I remember I, I finally shared this thing with him. And like like we were talking about today, there's nothing magic about talking to my branch president, but that was a symbol of me opening myself up mm. to Christ and saying, "Here I am. I am naked. I've been trying to make fig fig leaves for six years. Please give me your coat." And I took that coat on me and I never want to take it off again. You know? Oh man. It makes me think of, um, the same, the same man, David Durfee. He told me this and I'll never forget. He said, I used to keep the commandments to avoid going to hell. Mm. And he said, now I keep the commandments to put on Christ, Mm. to put on his power. It's just a perspective shift that it's more founded in trust yeah do you know what i'm saying love and faith is always a better motivator than fear and punishment yeah mm-hmm. and maybe maybe we associate to the relationships we have the temporal relationships with the spiritual relationships uh david a bednar um he was saying once that like he was talking about the difference between covenant relationship and covenant connection and he's like i just think that covenant relationship like covenant connection is just stronger it's a connection mm-hmm. and i think that is w- which then enhances the relationship that it builds the trust for sure but like he's all in and the only way we can test that is by turning to him and and uh doing the things that he promises us and i think that that brings joy i think that gives us hope i think it gives us strength you know to do the things in the moment whatever it is that we're that we're struggling mm-hmm Gosh, Jesus is awesome. Listen, man, when people it say the Book of Mormon, when people say the Book of Mormon is like, like Satan does not care if people think Joseph Smith wrote it. Yeah. He just don't want you to know that Jesus is saying this stuff. Yeah. I really think that's what mm-hmm. it is, man. I think that like the clarity it's in so, here too. Yeah, it's so ah. it's like the atonement of Jesus Christ is taught so clearly in the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. And it gives examples. It doesn't just teach the doctrine. It's like, here's an example of this happening, a person actually doing this, yeah. and believing this, you know? Yeah. And here, here's a side tangent to kind of go off of that is, you know, this is a channel, and you guys know, we talk about the evidences for the Book of Mormon. But why do we do that? We do it so, we can pro- so that we can provide uh, a substantial amount of evidence so we can stop talking about it and start talking about what we're talking about today. Because the where it happened, how it happened, that is all, it's not even secondary, it's tertiary to... Tertiary. Tertiary, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> to this right here, stop putting off your repentance. Repent, and you will be blessed with all of these things. I, I, yeah. saw, this, I saw this little random short clip. I think it was Adam Miller. I, mm-hmm. I've never met Adam Miller, Me but either. I thought it was so interesting and profound. It was like the Book of Mormon is in the scriptures are not about what you should know more than they are than what you should do about what you know. Mm. You know what I'm saying? One of the ways to know the Book of Mormon is true is to not just know it, but to live the things that it teaches. That's how you can know. Like, this sounds so fluffy, but I'm telling you, like, one of the, is it, well, maybe this is posed as a question. Mm. Can faith, and at first I think it's going to be a fluffy perspective, yeah, yeah. but can faith be one of the highest levels of evidence that the Book of Mormon is true? Do you know what I'm saying? Of what faith really is. Not like, I'm saying not because people use that term like, like uh, you know, if we're considering like, you know, semantics, right? You could mm-hmm. say faith like your your religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm losing my faith, but I'm saying what faith really is evidence of things not seen mm-hmm. that are true, right? Could that be one of the biggest pieces of evidence? I you know, that's the, the cherry on I would the say top. It's the biggest evidence. Is what are the fruits of the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge that is within these pages, and when you commit yourself to to partaking of that spiritual knowledge and living it, what are the fruits of that? That to me is it's it joy. is the greatest. It is the greatest evidence of its divinity. The words in here are are delicious. I just want to munch but them up all what day. But that's what That's what Lehi said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. He does. And, yeah. and what is it? Fourteen? No, no, fourteen. Is it twelve or twelve? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh no, it's eleven. First Nephi eleven. Uh huh. Like it's delicious above like, uh, the all the say? yeah oh, yeah the, the the most the love of God is delicious above all the over. fruit of Fruits. repentance is mm-hmm. the most delicious thing you're asking is it joyous like what mm-hmm. does it feel like I feel like Lehi described it so well it's like repentance mm-hmm. when you when you partake of it not just hold it in your hand yeah that's when you don't get ashamed of it 
Mm -hmm. right? You taste it. You taste, like, the love of God is that he gave his only begotten son, Mm -hmm. and that's what the fruit is. That's the fruit of the gospel. The fruit of the gospel is the sacrifice of his son, Mm -hmm. that when we truly eat it and partake of it. You want to scream to the world. Yeah. Come to the freaking tree. Yeah. Just like Lehi did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think it's one of the biggest evidences because if a text that holds teachings when applied can tackle that monster that is the natural man, which we learn is an enemy to God, right? If the principles found in this book of scripture applied can turn us into new creatures into Christ, like that alone is such an evidence to its authenticity of being divine, something from God. Because it's tackling the biggest monster on the freaking earth, which is Us. our carnal <laughs> desires. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Yeah. Do, when did you read the Book of Mormon for the first time? When did you get listen, a, a listen, testimony? I want to hear about that. Man, this is crazy because when I was a kid, um, I don't know if I'm dyslexic, but I feel like I am. Like, <laughs> like in most people, like, like when, you know, I was a kid in class. Whenever you go around the room and the teacher's reading well, out loud, I'm like counting the people. Like that's me. I hated reading. I felt I felt so embarrassed reading out loud. And so every time we'd read in class, it would be like the uh, Guinness Book of World Records, right? That's what I would read because it's like just the pictures and yeah. stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's you know, exactly everybody's reading, everybody, I'm going to date myself, but everybody's reading the boxcar children and like goosebumps uh-huh. and stuff You're like, like that. Ripley's Believe I'm It or Ripley, Not. I'm believing like, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Like five like, tongues. It's like yes. the OG version of scrolling. Right? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's, oh, yes, I'm sc- yes, that's scrolling 100% right. Ripley's. <laughs> and so I had this advisor, uh, and when I was a deacon, man, when I was like 12 at the time, and he thought he just dumped this Book of Mormon on the table and he said, I got a child, I got an invitation. I want you guys to read the whole book. And I'm like, no, like I like the last thing in my life that I would ever do would be read the Book of Mormon. OK, not only that, you open the thing up and it's two columns, man. So this thing's at 500 and something pages, but it's really like a thousand because that's like two pages. That's like double columns. OK. And so he, all he said, he's like, I remember my friend Logan, he had a little, one of those little digital watches yeah. and he was like, all right, uh, Hey Logan, I want you to time something. And he gave me the book. He said, read a verse. And I just read a verse and he timed it. It was like mm-hmm. six seconds or something. And then he said, okay, read another verse. And he timed it. And it was like, I don't know, maybe a little bit more, seven mm-hmm. seconds. And then I read three. Anyways, like average was like five to six seconds. He's like, if you tell me that you don't have five or six seconds a day, <laughs> and you, you got something wrong with you, right? So he just said, don't read the whole thing. Just read one verse a day. And so I started just, I was like, man, what is he talking about? I'll read a verse a day. So I started reading a verse a day, man. Like when I, when I was like 12 or 13, I started reading the Book of Mormon every day, just one verse. Just one verse. But okay. for the long, I want to say for a long time, it was just one verse. Yeah. And then that led to two. But I'm telling you, it got to the point where when I would start to read, man, it just felt like, like no, no lie, man. Like it just felt like Jesus was just right there with me. Mm. And so that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. And so then I started reading more because like it would take me longer, but I didn't start caring about the time. Like it would bring stuff to my mind of the stuff that I needed to do, things I needed to change. It was powerful, man. And so I started reading the Book of Mormon every day right around the time when I was 12. Mm. And I hated reading. And at the same time, like I was still like reading the Cliff's Notes versions for like book reports, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I would read the Book of Mormon every day right before seminary. Um, I would read it. I'd wake up maybe to just like fifteen minutes early, and I'd just read. And then I finished it. I finished it. I read, he said like two and a half pages. And so ever since then, man, I could probably, I could probably count on my hand how many times that I've missed, man, because mm-hmm. I always read at least one verse. You just read one verse. I always read at least one. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever read Atomic Habits? Yeah. By James Clear. Yep. It's just that starting is the hardest part, man. Starting is the hardest part. Pick something that is like the lowest barrier to entry. And what you find out, like I, I used to have this goal, um, because my stake president. And this goes back. This wasn't meant to be the the subject of it, but it had to do with overcoming pornography. He told me, "Hey, uh, we have this program index for two hours a week, and it'll help you overcome pornography." And I was like, "Oh man!" So I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna do two hours." So I'd be like, "Okay, I'm gonna do an hour on this day, an hour on that day." Never did it for like six weeks. I just never, yeah. never did it. And then I was like, "You know what? I can do one name a day." And I did one name a day, but it always turned into two or three because once you do the one, yeah. you're like, oh, you that's like eight seconds, right? Mm-hmm. And so do the same thing with the Book of Mormon. Everyone watching, please, first off, never think that this replaces your scripture study. Just because we read a few scriptures here, this, this, isn't, this doesn't count as scripture study. Please get into the word yourself and 
If, if, if you're having a hard time, do exactly what our brother over here did. Just start with the verse a day. You know, maybe it's just I, – I knew there was this uh, – this, um, it's Greg McCune again. Shout out to Greg McCune. Anyway, yeah. uh, no, he um, he was an Elders Corn president. I heard him on this podcast. Their goal in their Elders Corn was just to open up Family Search. Not yeah. even do not even do anything. Just open it. And there was a guy in their um, in their quorum that started doing like forty hours a week, man. <laughs> but it's just, but he but their goal for the quorum was just to open it. Open it. That's it. Just yeah. open the book. Just open the book. So, yeah. open what percentage of, of people do you day. think read the scriptures every day? Not a lot. It's it's a topic, man. You start talking it's, about scripture study, it's man. It's like a wall. Like, <laughs> it's like nobody wants. Like, what'd you say it again? Say it again. Yeah. You know, people don't want to talk. I about mean, it. even I sometimes, and I've I had to check myself starting the stick of Joseph. Sometimes I'm like, oh, well, I'm editing about the scriptures, or <laughs> you know, we're we're doing the stick of Joseph thing that like sometimes I've missed, and I'm like, I haven't been in the scriptures myself today. Yeah, we've been doing all this research on you know the land of bountiful or on this or that, but I didn't open the scriptures, and I think it's really easy for people to fall off. Especially with these freaking things, these yeah. things trick you, man. Makes it easier and harder. It makes it easier and harder. It's a tool. It's a double-edged sword. But I'll tell you the coolest thing. My son is only he sees eight right now. Yeah. And uh, we just started just watching the films, man. Just watching, just watch the video. To start with that, yeah. And I'm like, you know what? We were reading. It was just a headache, man. I was like, let's just watch. They pick every every day. They get to pick one. And the other day, I was like, I was like, hey, do you guys look? I know that the Book of Mormon is true, but have you ever asked God for yourself if it's true? Mm-hmm. And my son Ezra was like, I know it's true. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Cool. He's like, I, I just know. I know that it is. I can feel it. I was like, all right. But like, it's got to be yours. Mm-hmm. And the only way you can do that is if you do it, you know? Mm-hmm. For sure. So. No, I love that, man. That's awesome. A question I have for you, Stephen, is like, I'm sure you have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people that maybe have doubts in their faith and doubts of, you know, Joseph Smith, the restoration of the church. What percentage of those people do you think that come in with doubts are, ha- have done the work, I guess, to develop a personal testimony with Jesus Christ? Like, are they ever having qualms with like mm. the Book of Mormon not really approximating them to Jesus Christ or like what is their main concerns usually about man I like what I like to do so I don't want to redirect the question because but I do think it's important to consider I like to anytime anybody has any question about anything Mm -hmm. I always I'll write on a piece of paper I'll write it on the board or like some kind of whiteboard and I'll just have to be honest and I'll just say what assumptions are you making about this question the way you're phrasing it Joseph Smith Mm. anything right mm. what are the assumptions like honest assumptions mm-hmm. like give me one we can figure it out, like right now like like a, a doubt yeah. about the church or something yeah like a question that's common that you hear like why did joseph smith why do 19th century texts show up in the book of mormon so okay why do 19th century texts show up in the book of mormon okay yeah. what assumptions might we be making about why 19th century texts might show up in the book of mormon the first assumption is, oh, because he copied it from other 19th century works. We're That's assuming, we're, well, what, what, what more to that? What do you mean? That that Joseph Smith, we're assuming that first he had access to all of those uh, 19th century things, and second, that he was just plagiarizing them all in there. So there's like assumptions made that aren't based on facts. Yeah. They're just assumptions. Yeah, we're assuming that, like, why couldn't God do that? Why could, like, like that the, the, that the word, the way that it's written, mm-hmm. is significance to the meaning? I mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm making this up right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. but like, what other what other ones you can think of mm-hmm. assumptions? Well, yeah, a positive assumption is that I, I would assume that it would that Joseph Smith would just be familiar with that language. So when he's translating the Book of Mormon, he's just using the language that he knows. But what does that mean? What if what if let's say he did copy it? Mm-hmm. What if it is that language? Mm-hmm. So if it doesn't match, like which lang- what, what should it be? Like it has to be a certain thing. Like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like and if mm-hmm. it isn't a certain thing, then that means what? Mm-hmm. What's that? What, what is underneath that? Like, if it isn't this certain way, then therefore what? What does that mean? Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. You, what does that mean? Asking those questions, like, ask it to the end. So maybe, the, so then I can reframe the question, right? I can mm-hmm. reframe it, and then I can say to myself, like, okay, maybe I need to change the question based off the, my my. There's the assumptions in my question, okay? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So now let me reframe the question. Like, maybe a question might be like. like basically what I'll do is I'll look at each assumption and say, well, what is true, right? Mm-hmm. 
um, I don't know everything about how translation works. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming maybe I know that how it works. I don't yeah. know. Do you know how it works? How it should, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I do know that the front of the book of Mormon says that it was miraculous. It was by the hand of God. Mm -hmm. Right. So we know that. And then, so maybe my, ch as I go through my assumptions, the, the, the actual question could change. Like, mm. like, is it possible that the book of Mormon is, I don't remember how you phrased it. Mm -hmm. How'd you say it? Mm -hmm. Essentially, like, why does 19th century like, English, English, or basically King James English show up in the Book of Mormon? Why does King James English? Now, I think that it's important to go over some factual things that are good for that. I don't think it's just like pie in the sky, like, like only like spiritual perspective. But I got to test yeah. my assumptions. I'm assuming that like, um, uh, what if God, what if God needs to use the language that the Bible is like in King James, most, the most mm -hmm. common Bible, there's a lot yeah. of versions, but mm -hmm. it's the most common one for yeah. sure. And so I don't know. Like, he wants to appeal to people. He, he wants, wants to, appeal to, it wants so to appeal so to people. Foreign to him. So it's not mm -hmm. so foreign to him. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, does God have the ability to do that? Yeah. I mean, no, 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 but yeah. I think he definitely does. <laughs> no yeah. way. No you know? way. I, believe <laughs> I mean, he, maybe he can create the earth, but there's no way. Well, this is a question I think happens that a lot of people have, but they, it's like almost too cliche. Like why do bad things happen to good people? Right. And so, if God's so loving, why does he let bad things happen to good people? It's like, well, maybe the, my assumption might be that God wants bad things to happen mm. to good people. Mm. Maybe my assumption is that God doesn't care if bad things happen to good people. Maybe my assumption is that... Um, that uh, If I'm good, then bad yeah, things shouldn't it, happen to exactly. me. I don't so, deserve it. So then I go around and like, if, if God is so loving... I, mean, I want to reframe my question, right? Mm. My, my question might then change to... Um, I don't know how I would rephrase it, but basically... Uh, since God is a loving God, why would he allow bad things to happen? Like, yeah. I don't know. You get what I'm saying? No, I get what you're saying. I'm trying to think I, of what, how I'd rephrase yeah, it because I'm think just thinking about talking. Yeah. A good example of this is actually uh, when the sons of Mosiah, I can't remember who it was, um, but they're talking to King Lamoni, right? And mm -hmm. they start asking him questions. Do you believe there's a God? Do you believe that he created all these things? Like, setting the foundation for what their assumptions are. Mm -hmm. So, for example, someone yeah. comes up and they're like, it looks like, uh, well, if the Book of Mormon is really ancient scripture, why is it in King James English? Y you have to start off by asking this. Do you believe there is a God? <laughs> if you believe in a God, do you believe that he still speaks today or that he's done speaking? Do you believe that the only people he ever spoke to were in the Middle East? Do you believe, you ask these certain questions, right? And then once you get the answers to those questions, exactly what you're saying, you realize that the assumptions influence your question in the they first do. place. They do. I really like that. I think that's really wise. And I think you could do this in your life in general, man. Like with everything. With everything. Like even when you're trying to start a business, like what assumptions are you making? And because they, they kind of like, they they prevent you from acting. Mm. They prevent you from moving forward. Mm. But to get to your question, it's like, I think that many people are not aware of the assumptions they're asking that are, that are in tied to the questions that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of this is, you know, in my own personal, uh, sometimes I, I was talking to a guy named Clint Pulver and he's like this, uh, he's a, he's a speaker, but he talks to people who have left organizations. Like he, he really like an expert on millennials and like, how do you lead millennials basically? Mm. And he said that people usually quit their closest manager when they quit an organization. And mm. when I was talking to him, I was like, huh? So, and I, in a church situation, would that maybe be the Bishop? Mm. But then I thought more, I was like, it's the parents. I think that sometimes the parents, yeah. I think that people associate their experience in the gospel with their experience of how their parents interpret the gospel. Mm. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not always, mm. but, um, but a lot of times that could be the case. Like their perspective of God sometimes, the reason why they don't want to talk to a bishop, the reason why they don't want to pray is because they, we might assume that mm. God is like my dad. I might assume that, uh, that, that uh, my bishop is, because uh, it's funny, because there's, there's some people that, before you're the bishop, they want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. But when you're the bishop, they don't want to talk to you. I'm yeah. the same guy. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I haven't changed. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. The, dude, this is really, I love this right here because if you are, if we are doing it correctly, we should be connecting ourselves directly to the power source. But what happens, I guess, is a, an analogy what you're saying is that if you try to get the power of God through other people, you're going to realize that they see through a glass darkly, that they don't reflect the light of Christ 
as clearly as if you were turning straight to him. And so what happens is you associate the, the feelings that you get uh, from other people and the way they act to the feelings that come from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When yeah. Really, it should be if you're plugged into Jesus, like that stream of light and consciousness, you'll, you'll be so full that you're not going to want to go anywhere else. Yeah. But as soon as you're trying to get that see, light through other people, it, you're just like, I... But going back, going back to 2 Nephi chapter chapter 2, yeah. it's that broken heart and contrite spirit, that mm-hmm. humility is so vital. Like, I feel like, hum, like the heart is connected to the eyes. Mm-hmm. It affects the way you see. And it's so simple, but it's so... Difficult. It's hard. <laughs> because it takes trust to be humble. Mm-hmm. Right, like to to really believe that God is the one who's really in control. God is the one who I'm really yeah. ultimately responsible to. I mean, I love that there's real people, men and women, that lead the church mm-hmm. who course. understand that life is really hard. Like that, my judge in Israel is a person who really like lives a life in real life, like me, who's dealing with the crap too. That's yeah. dealing with like that that knows that life is challenging too. But versus, I mean, that's Jesus, condes- the condescension of God. I'm not saying that bishops are like that. Our God. Yeah, but I'm yeah. saying it's it's kind of cool that you have an advocate who is connecting you to the ad- ultimate advocate who really knows. Yeah. You know? That's who Jesus was. That's what's so powerful about him. Yeah. He's, he's not just some all-knowing, powerful being that's sitting up there being like, you do this that's because why we I said. Trust him. He's like down here. He was down here. He knows how bad it sucks to be alive sometimes, you know, more than yeah. anyone. Jackson, you got something, bro? No, dude. I was just thinking about when you were talking about the closest, you know, leader to them is a lot of times our parents. And it just reminds me, dude, I'm so amped to be a dad. How many kids do you got? Five. Five. How old are you, dude? Bro, I'm I'm older than you. I don't know. (laughs) Bro, you got 40, man. Really? You're 40? I'm 40. Yeah, you do not seem 40, man. Damn, I'm 40. It's good, dude. And I started late. You look good. You look good. Oh, yeah. Bless you, man. You got five kids. You got two kids. And like, how many do you have? I got zero. You got zero. Sorry. Well, they're just not I mean, here yet. They're, well, he yeah. has them. I'm, I'm sorry. I, that's sens- a lot. Dude. <laughs> that's a sensitive a piece for me, man. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's not a sensitive piece. But it kind of is, dude. I'm kind of excited now. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, dude, I'm just so excited to be able to teach the gospel to my ki- children and make them to feel like help them understand the love of Jesus Christ. Like mm. I'm so excited about that. And I feel like we, mm. dude, it, the book of Mormon is riddled with h- how often do we see the phrase, the foolish traditions of your fathers with so the Lamanites. True. They believed in the tradition, the foolish traditions of their fathers. Right. And, um, in Jacob chapter one, verse, uh, verse 19, Jacob's just talking about, you know, how he's gone about teaching the people and why he says, And we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our own heads, uh, upon our own heads, if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Wherefore, Mm. by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. Otherwise, their blood would come upon our garments, and we would not be found spotless at the last day. Like, our responsibility to... And, and I see that right now as I am my brother's keeper. I, sh- I so strongly believe I am my brother's keeper. Like in the Bible, we read the three parables the together. Lost, the, the, lost, the lost sheep, the lost piece of silver, yeah. and then the last one. Mm, the, the lost coin. The lost coin. No, the, the, that's so silver, the, right. the parable of the dude. I'm so dumb right now. <laughs> the lost sheep, the lost in the, in the prodigal son. Then the prodigal the son, son, dude. Okay, yeah. A lot of times we look at the prodigal son one at the end and we're like, ah, they got to figure it out, bro. They got to come to themselves. Like, mm-hmm. they got to figure it out. But we read in the first two, they sought out diligently that lost piece of silver. He left the 99 and he went after that one. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to. Dude, I'm just maybe just rambling here, but it just shows us the responsibility that we have to teach the gospel to other people in a way that they will be able to accept it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. And so we don't become that person that, that is their closest superior in the gospel, and they you know, get a sour taste in their mouth and end up leaving. Mm. Listen, I think that um, there's a That's lot of money, stuff dude. here with parents. Be, being a parent is like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, most humbling thing I've ever done. Oh, dude, it's like, way hard. Like, if you want to feel <laughs> stupid, just let 
try to get the attention of a four year old and have them just completely ignore you. Like, like we do that to God all the time. Anyway, but our kids <laughs> in the terrible twos right now. Oh man, oh. listen, they want they want to do it themselves. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying though is, uh, this is something I learned from uh, it's a, it's from Elder Packer. He was uh, he was in a he was in the MTC once. And it was in the '90s. This yeah. is in the world's worst now, right? Um, this is another thing I learned from Dave Mercy, uh, uh, Dave Durfee, actually. Gosh, it looks like we this need guy, to get Dave. You Durfee. need to get Dave Durfee <laughs> in here, man. <laughs> what I'm was serious. the other guy? Uh, Greg, Greg, McEwen. Greg McEwen. No, I'm serious. Um, <laughs> he was in this meeting, and um, he said that uh, in this meeting, he looked. He was with the missionaries in the MTC, right? And he said he was talking to mission presidents. He's like, the success of a mission president is not by the baptisms, but like your actual missionaries, right? Who yeah. they become. Mm-hmm. But he said, if you teach your own children the commandments and not the atonement, you'll lose them. And now this is at a time in the nineties when like the world, the world is like the world is terrible. It was like it was like it's not fifty fifty anymore, man. It's mm-hmm. like the evil is on the like, it is on the up and up. If, and, and so what I do as a dad, I try my hardest to do this. I'm not a perfect dad. I make mistakes every day. But I try as often as I can to tell my kids, I'm like, listen, I don't care. You, there's nothing that you could do that would change the way that I Love feel you. about you. Okay? Like, if you make a mistake, we're here to help you. We're not here to try to knock you down. And I feel like as parents, we can be better at that. A lot of times we want to appear a certain way. Mm-hmm. And a friend, of my, uh, a friend of mine named Stephen Tager, he told me this. He said, sometimes we worship ourselves worshiping God. Mm. You know, like you understand That's, what I'm saying? Yeah. Wait, say and that one more time. Sometimes bro. it says that there shall be no other gods, mm-hmm. but sometimes our God is ourselves worshiping God. It's like, kind of self righteousness. It's, it's a way like of we mm-hmm. want to appear a certain mm-hmm. way. We want to show that we look perfect. We want to seem. That's that the we're Pharisees. Good. The Pharisees yeah. worship themselves, worshiping God. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And in that effort, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. We put a lot of pressure on our kids. And there's certain things out there, like mental with mental health. Sometimes it's. It can be even more challenging, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's things that exist like scrupulosity, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we kind of, you know, we're, we're hard on ourselves. But then again, we need to rely on the Redeemer. Mm. Um, shout out to Dave Durfee again. Yeah. <laughs> this is what he said in this meeting. He put up this slide. He said, what if you focus less on your badness and more on the goodness of Christ? Mm. What if you focus less on your falling down and more on Christ lifting you up? What if you focus less on your shrinking and more on Christ's reaching? What if you focus less on his, more on his sacrifice than your sin? Mm-hmm. And I think that we got to focus on, like, yeah, the commandments are part of a covenant. And the redemption was first. The first thing was the plan of redemption. And then he made a covenant with us. And he said, hey, here's these commandments. This will keep my spirit with you. I want to be with you. That's why I'm giving them to you. Yeah, and then he he gave his son. He gave us the Holy Ghost mm. to help us to stay, to like to to continuously come back to him, right? And um, but we got to focus on him, not just when we make a mistake, but whenever we're doing anything. Yeah, do yeah. everything in the name of the Son. You know, I saw a study they did the other day, and I don't know any of the specifics of it except for the <laughs> result. Okay, okay, and <clears throat> they were doing a study on mental health to see if the mental health would be improved more by the increase of positive thoughts or the decrease of negative thoughts. Mm. And like, say it again. They, they wanted to know if mental health would improve by the increase of positive thoughts. So increase positive or decrease, or decrease negative. decrease of the negative. Focus more on the negative or more focus more on the positive. Is that mm-hmm. what it is? Yeah. yeah. Or, or just like have the same amount of negative thoughts, but just try to think more positively. Right? Okay. And far and wide, they showed that Eliminating all negative thoughts altogether and only focusing on the positive greatly increases mental health rather than just, you know, still having negative thoughts but trying harder to think more positive. Does that make sense? Yeah, this, this makes me think of the idea of like we, we compartmentalize Jesus Christ a mm-hmm. lot and we make it like his attributes. I want to get this attribute and then I'll mm-hmm. go to the next one. Yeah. I want to go to the next one. It's like he's full of grace and truth. He is 100% has all of them. And I feel like, to your point, we should focus less on don't make a mistake Mm -hmm. and just if you make a mistake, okay, I made a mistake. And then just focus on keeping the spirit. Like like we always try to gear up to get it. Mm -hmm. Just assume you got it and notice when you lose it. Mm -hmm. And then each day try to figure out what you can do 
in other words, I feel like it's like this idea of focusing on maintaining the Holy Ghost versus like trying to get it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Or not, or try not to lose it. Or try not, trying not to lose it. Yeah. Noticing oh. when you lose it. Dude, that's, dude, that is like the biggest thing. Cause that is all based out of fear. It's all based out. Trying not Don't lose to it. sin Don't lose is, it. Based, yeah. is based on a fear. Like this idea, like when you're, when you're trying to, once again, it's just cause it's, it's what I know because it's the experience I've had, but like trying not to look at pornography is exhausting and you will eventually give up. But trying to fill your life with something positive, trying to be like Christ, you don't have enough time for pornography at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so what you were saying about this idea of focusing on Christ's sacrifice more than our sins and focusing on all these things more than that, it's just that whatever you look at, you become. Whoever you idolize, you become. And so it's stop looking at yourself. It's kind of this is kind of a mixed up way, but you were saying about worshiping ourselves, worshiping God. Sometimes we can worship ourselves, not worshiping God. If you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And so instead of doing that, let's just worship God. Dude, this is why I'm realizing this now. This is why I sucked it at soccer in high school. <laughs> why? <Because, laughs> you didn't suck at soccer. Dude, because I, my mindset was always, cause I was a center defender. My all, my mindset was always like, don't let them get past. Don't let them get past. Instead uh-huh. of, Go steal the ball. Go take (laughs) the ball. And so I was always basing my actions off of fear of not letting them get past past, instead of accomplishing my goal of taking the ball from them. Yeah, that's good. King, like dude, that. if I but then, go back, I'd but you'd then, be in the MLS. You'd be in the MLS <laughs> but see, right but what now. If, but what if, what if, they, what if you had a promise that every time you went to get the ball, you would get it? I feel like that's like what what, what, true, like, what yeah. faith really is. Faith yeah. is not just some pie in the sky thing. It's like it's an assurance of something that was already promised. Mm. It already exists. It already is real. He already did redeem us, right? But we are going to live in a way that we actually believe it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? For sure. And that's hard to do. Right? Man, this has been awesome. You have any more questions for him, or we we let this guy just leave us Dude, with a fire? Dude, it testimony. sucks. We got these mic stands now, and we can't just. It's harder to take it out and drop it. But it's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, sh- thank you so much. We should get a microphone just to drop. Yeah, <laughs> that we just keep just to drop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Please share with us final thoughts, your testimony of Jesus Christ of the Book of Mormon, and what you want people to remember Listen, from this combo. I mean, to me, by the way, the other verses were Second Nephi. 31, 19, Mosiah 2, 2, 20 through 24, mm-hmm. Alma 22, 13 through 14, Alma 24, 10, 11, 10 through 11, Helaman 14, 13, Moroni 6, 4, you already mentioned that one. Yeah. Um, I, re- I believe, I think the word belief is a gift. Mm-hmm. In, in uh, Doctrine and Covenants 46, it says, it talks about these different gifts. One gift is to believe, to know. It's a gift to know that Jesus is the Christ, Right. But then it's a gift to believe on the words of those who know. And mm. belief is a gift. Satan knows that Jesus Christ is real. But I, so I say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I believe that, uh, that repentance is the way that we can be- come closer to God. Um, I hope that there's nothing that we've said today that's, that's really uh, caused anyone to feel like they're not heard. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Cause I think that we could definitely yeah. do better at listening to people. Do you know what I mean? There's people who are suffering that just need somebody to just hear what they got to say. But what I do know is that God wants to hear us and we should never be scared to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And so I would just invite everybody out there listening to like, like God wants to talk to you and this book in so many different versions of it, whatever he, um, he's, He's, he's standing with open arms, like President Nelson said, willing, waiting to forgive and to, uh, to uplift and, to, and to, to help us. Anyway. Amen. Well, if you haven't yet, go on YouTube. Go to Let's Get Real with Stephen Jones. Check out his show. He has some awesome interviews. He's a legend. And until next time, stay curious and hungry.